So uh, hopefully you're here for the Internet Archive session, um, Internet Archive and Open APIs. Um, quick introductions. I am VM Brasseur. Those of you who have seen me before may not recognize me because I am wearing shoes. Um, you can find my contact information here, email, Twitter, where I tweet way too much. Um, IRC, that's both Freenode and Perl.irc.org. Sorry, irc.perl.org. I always transpose those. And then my website, if you care. Um, we're all friends here, so you can just call me Vicky. You don't have to make any virtual machine jokes about my name. You can just call me Vicky. Uh, you may notice that I'm up here alone. Alexis is unable to make it today because life is even more complicated than code. So, uh, but here is her contact information. It's grayed out to show that she's a ghost right now. Um, so uh, she is Director of Media and Access at Internet Archive. Um, I will tell you up front, I haven't worked full time at Internet Archive for a few years. So when we get to the Q&A session, there are many times when I might say, ooh, you should ask Alexis. That's why her contact information is still here, because you will still need it. Apologies in advance. Or you can just say, hey, make shit up, and I totally will. So, um, so in a moment, I'm going to show a slide which you may want to take photos of because it contains all of the URLs you could possibly need for this session. And I'll tell you what those URLs are. Once everybody's ready with their phones, if you want to take, okay. And if you don't get these now, don't worry, I'll show them at the end if you decide it's finally worthwhile to waste some pixels on it. Um, so the first one, we have the Internet Archive GitHub because that's the new hotness. Everyone has to have something on GitHub. Most of the stuff that I'm going to show you is available on GitHub. Pull requests are, of course, welcome, because that is the open source way. The second one is probably, I think, the most important, although the third eh, is good, too. Um, the second one is our Zotero bibliography. I'm going to be throwing a ton of links at you in this particular thing. Don't go snapping all the photos. You don't have to. It's OK. Every single API document, every single example, all of it is on this Zotero bibliography, which you can access. So just go there. One stop shopping. But if you'd rather just see the slides, those are available already on where else? Internet Archive. Apparently, we're going to have a video of this once it's available. I will be downloading that and re-uploading it to the archive at that same URL. So you can just get, again, one-stop shopping. We like to be helpful. So I'm going to dive into the part where Alexis normally would have done it. Um, this could be a little rough. Let's see how this goes. This is my tour of Internet Archive. Really, this is Alexis's tour of Internet Archive. I am nowhere near as exciting and energetic as she is. So let's see what we can do. This is the building of Internet Archive. It is uh, based in San Francisco, California, but it has scanning centers all over the world. This is an old Christian science church. We will neither confirm nor deny that we bought it because it looks like our logo. Um, there's not really a lot to show you on the tour as far as the archive itself, so we will be showing you photos of the building, which is stunning. So Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library. We are accredited as a library in the state of California. Um, our, our goal is to have universal access to all human knowledge. If there's knowledge out there, we want it so we can make it available to everyone else uh, as freely as possible. We have a lot of partners with libraries and other memory institutions who help us gather information and make it available. Um, we have right now 24 petabytes of unique data. Just today, that was actually in August. I haven't gotten the updated number. I wouldn't be surprised if it's up to 24 now or 25 now. That is stored at least twice, plus the overhead of, say, running a website and little things like that. We have approximately 55 petabytes of spinning disk that we ourselves maintain. This is a photo from inside the great room of Internet Archive. This is where we hold all of our big events, such as the amazing one that will be going on on Wednesday at the Archive. This is our yearly blowout shindig. It is on Wednesday at the Archive. You can go and see the beautiful building and hear about all the fantastic shit we've been working on this year. So the most frequently asked question that we get how do you make money? How do you do this? So the archive is a uh, 14 to $15 million a year operation right now. 
40% of our budget comes from uh, book digitization. We work with partners, libraries, uh, archives, and the like. They send us their stuff to one of our scanning centers. We scan it, digitize it, uh, OCR it, make it available on the archive, as well as giving them copies, because lots of copies keep stuff safe. 20% of it comes from uh, contractual web archiving projects. Say you are the government of New Zealand, as we all are at some point in our life or other, right? <laughs> um, so say you're the government of New Zealand. You can come to the archive and say, hey, could you please do a scan on a regular basis of every single .nz domain out there? And then give it to us. And oh, by the way, you can keep a copy for yourself to put it in the Wayback Machine. We'll go, yes, this is how much that costs. So um, that's where we get about 20% of our money. 40% of it comes from foundations and donations. And I'm really super pleased that this adds up to 100. So that is where we get our money. Um, Right now, the archive has approximately 100 employees. After you've been there for three years, we get an artist to make a cute little statue of you. It's either cute or creepy, depending upon your point of view. Um, the reason why I say it might be creepy is that this, these are in the great room where you saw the stained glass window. They are standing in the pews. And it can be a little weird at first. But it's, uh, it's really cool. So that one's Sam, and that one's Peter, that one's Tracy. Um, so who uses? archive.org, who uses the, uh, the Internet Archive. We are in the top 250 websites. Where we are depends upon who's hot that day. Um, three to four million people visit the archive every single day. We have four million downloads or streams every single day. And aside from that, we don't know. Those four million could be from a single person, and we just don't know. We don't keep email. We don't keep IP. We don't keep anything. Privacy is incredibly important to us, not only because we're a library, but because it's the right thing to do. We do run our own data centers. As I mentioned, we have 55 petabytes of spinning disk right now. Um, we have two data centers at the moment. One is in San Francisco in that beautiful building. It's really impressive to see all these racks of blinking lights in an old, beautiful church. Um, another one is in Richmond, California, right across the bay. And those of you who are geographically inclined are going, um, fault lines, not such a good idea to have your backup and your main. And we know that. And it's something that we're working on. But as you can imagine, duplicating 24 petabytes of information and serving it up and keeping that, those disks healthy is not a cheap thing. So if you want to do that for us on the East Coast, bring it on. Um, we will gladly take that donation. So one of the things everybody thinks about as soon as you say Internet Archive is, what the hell is that? And then you say, hey, we run the Wayback Machine. And they all go, oh, I know the Wayback Machine. Um, the Wayback Machine has over 40 billion uh, unique, discrete captures right now. I believe we're up to or 40. Pfft, screw 40. Order of magnitude. We are 425 billion. Uh, unique captures. These go from 1996 to the present day. Um, it's usually updated within just a few hours. We are constantly, constantly, constantly crawling. 700,000 people per day use the Wayback Machine. We do know how many people hit it. Um, if you want to do any sort of research about the history of the web or anything like that, please contact us or Alexis, probably alexis at archive.org. Um, we can hand you, just go can hand you an 80 terabyte crawl of so much data that you can then data mine and do what you want with to, uh, to do research. How many here have seen the Wayback Machine before? OK, almost everyone. So this slide is useless because you already know what it looks like. Um, so how do we decide what we want to archive on the web? So, Obviously, we do have people who pay us to do it. As I mentioned, we do this for New Zealand. Um, also, we have organizations that will donate their crawled content. Alexa Internet has been doing this for us for, since 1996. A few times a year, we get a huge dump from them, which we then get to put into the archive, into the Wayback Machine. We also do a ton of crawling on our own behalf. The things we do there are we try to do um, a very deep crawl on the most popular sites of the net, like just really deep dive on those and store those. And then we look for every single possible domain we can get our hands on, and we crawl those and make those available in the web, in the Wayback Machine. Um, for instance, you ever tweet a domain? We got that. Every single domain that's tweeted, we crawl. 
Every single outlink on every single language of Wikipedia, we crawl those. If you ever visit anything on a wordpress.org site, we crawl all of those sites and every single link in every single blog post. So we try and get as much information as we possibly can into the Wayback Machine. Part of the reason we want to do that is to minimize 404s, because this is knowledge that is being lost, that people can't access. What we would love to do sometime, anyone here at Mozilla? Anyone here know someone at Mozilla? Awesome, great. So what we want is we want to build this into Firefox. When you visit a site, we'll crawl it. When you uh, click a button, we'll add it to the Wayback Machine. If you hit a 404, it'll automatically redirect you to the Wayback Machine if there's a, uh, if there's a snapshot. So hey, let's, let's talk. Um, so there is another way to get things into the Wayback Machine, and that is by you. Any one of you right now can go to web.archive.org, go to this little Save Page Now widget, throw in a URL. What that will do is immediately crawl and take a snapshot of that site in its current format. Let's say perhaps a Congress critter says something untoward on Twitter. We can capture that right here. And then you will, we will hand you back a URL, which you can use as a permanent citation. Um, so that's pretty cool. So the web is awesome, but we do a lot more than just the web, as you notice from how we got our money. We also digitize books. This is one of our scanning centers. Um, we do a lot of that. We have 30 scanning centers right now in eight different countries, and we scan approximately 1,000 books a day. This is a very manual process because we care about the physical objects. We have people physically turning the pages. Um, and a lot of these are very old, very, very delicate books. And we still manage to crank out 1,000 books a day. So this does bring in about 40% of the budget, as I mentioned earlier. Um, despite the fact that book, books are not a, an obscure format yet, we do believe in preserving them because books burn. This is that very same scanning center I just showed you burning to the ground in 2013. Thankfully, no humans were harmed. And every book that was in there, I believe, every book, had already been scanned. So while the physical objects were lost, the knowledge was not, because we had already digitized it and put it into the archive. Um, so it is a shame that we lost those physical objects, and we do believe that physical objects are valuable. Because of that, we drink water. No, because of that, we have the physical archive. We now have two warehouses. Each one of these is a climate-controlled container. Inside of these, we have, uh, so far, about 1.5 million books. And we have LPs and VHS and software and everything we can get our hands on. The idea behind this is it's kind of a seed bank for the future, just in case. I don't know how many of you have gone to restore a backup and found that the backup didn't work. This is our backup. This is our physical backup. Um, so we've got all these books. We've got millions and millions and millions of books. And how do you get to them? The best way to do that is via openlibrary.org, which we run and operate. Um, the goal of openlibrary.org is to be one web page for every single book. Think of it like Wikipedia for books. You can edit it. You can add books. Uh, you can't remove books because that's wrong. Um, but uh, if the book exists in the archive, if the licensing allows it, you can download that book. Um, if you are print disabled, we offer print disabled options for people. And hello, we're a library. You can check these things out. You can check out ebooks from openlibrary.org. Beyond books, we also have a ton of video, so many videos. We've got two million items right now, um, including the astonishing Prelinger archive. If you haven't seen that, you should definitely look it up. Uh, we've got amazing things in there. We've got cartoons and films and just tons of stuff. Something else we've been doing a lot for the past few years is we archive 24 hours a day, 365 and a quarter days a year, 65 channels of television. We can't really make most of that available right now, but what we can make available is the TV News Archive. The TV News Archive is absolutely astonishing. What we allow you to do is to go to the closed captioning for all of these TV news shows, search it, and then we, what we will do is find all the references to that and then hand you a citation. 
TV is no longer ephemeral. Now you can cite it in all of your papers, and all of your journalism. Um, this is something that we are putting a huge effort behind for the 2016 American election season. So uh, if you find somebody says something interesting, you can cite it and have a permanent citation to that TV news program. So we've got video, we've got TV, we've got books. We also have audio because, hey, the more the merrier. We do want universal access to all human knowledge, and we mean it. Two and a half million items. Um, we have the world's largest live music archive. Anyone here like the Grateful Dead? Every single Grateful Dead concert ever, legitimately, <laughs> is here. I'm not just saying that to be hyperbolic, it's true. Um, we also have audiobooks and radio shows and podcasts. If any of you do any podcasting, you can host everything at Internet Archive. So you can put it there and we will save it and make sure it is available always. One of the most popular things we have right now is the software archive. How many of you have played Oregon Trail or some such thing on the software archive? Right, I know, yeah, you're like, woo, yay. Um, so we have about 100,000 titles now, and it is growing every single day. This is the uh, thank, thanks in large part to Jason Scott, jscott at archive.org. If you are a JavaScript junkie, we could totally use help with this uh, as a volunteer effort to help improve our emulation in the web browser. We are using JavaScript for that. It's astonishing. Um, this is, however, one of our most popular collections right now. So that was just like the high level of what you can do in the archive, what we have in the archive. Why should you care? Well, we are really good at storing and serving stuff up. I mean, we've been doing it pretty much literally before anyone else. 1996, how many organizations do you know that are still operating since 1996? Um, and we care about the same sort of things that every other open source community cares about. We care about sharing knowledge. We care about being open. We care about privacy. Um, and we really fight for that. We have gone to federal court to protect privacy, and we have won. So we really put our money where our mouth is. We're not the shiniest organization out there, but we're really friendly and we're nice and you want to like us. Um, so that's Alexa, Alexa, no, that's the internet place. Uh, that's Alexis's slides. Um, now we get to the part that I actually know, which are the Internet Archive APIs. Um, so I am a senior engineering manager at Hewlett Packard Engineering, and I'm going to uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So I'm going to do something we call in management, setting up expectations. There's a lot of stuff to cover. So I'm going to go quickly and go shallow. That's what I'm going to do. This is mostly to introduce you to what is possible using Internet Archive APIs, what APIs exist. And I'm going to leave it up to y'all to go out from there. Um, so. Let's start with the one that everybody probably knows something about, and that is the Wayback Machine. The Wayback Machine does have an API. It is quite simple. You can find the information here. It is a study in simplicity and ease. It gives you what you want, not what you don't. Here's what it looks like. You got your URL. Do I have a, ooh, yay, I got a pointy. Ha ha, I got a microphone and a pointy. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, you got your URL and you just put some parameters after it. There are three possible parameters, two of which are optional. It should come as no surprise to any of you that the one which is required is a URL. Um, otherwise, we can't tell. Do we have that website? Uh, when you give us a URL, just strip off the protocol. We don't need that. We don't, you don't need to tell us it's HTTP or HTTPS or FTP or Archie or Gopher or what have you. Um, we don't have those last three. But uh, yeah, so just give us the subdomain TLD. The timestamp, if you make a request and you give us a timestamp, we will see whether there A is a snapshot in the uh, Wayback Machine, and then B, if there are multiple, we will return a URL to the one closest to that timestamp. And then there's a callback that pretty much just returns it in JSONP rather than JSON. So um, all of the examples in this. Uh, the latter half of this are going to have a theme, and that is Pluto, because OMG New Horizons. Um, so this is really an unfortunate page. Pluto is no longer on the NASA Solar System Planets page. <sighs> Let's sigh. Maybe someday it will be back. But in the meantime, I want to see whether this page 
has a snapshot in the archive. So what I'm going to do is pass that to curl, make an API call. Um, here's the URL I'm looking for. Does that exist? Well, it turns out it does, or it did in July, uh, which is the last time I updated this slide. Uh, I can see that, yes, it is available. Here's the URL of the snapshot. And here's the timestamp when that snapshot was taken on July 7th or July 11th. And status 200, if you know your HTTP status codes, you can tell, ooh, yay, that worked. Um, had that not existed, it would have looked like this. Um, this, uh, this API is used in a few places right now, not probably as many as I think it should be, but I'm running out of water. Um, but one of the most interesting places where it is being used is in the Internet Archives 404 handler. This is a slick little piece of JavaScript that you can grab and slam on any page that you administer. What it's going to do is any link it finds, if your visitors click that and there's a 404, it's going to go out to the Wayback Machine and go, hey, crap, 404, do you have a snapshot? And then it's going to grab the closest snapshot and serve that up instead. So your users get a much better experience. They're not hitting 404s, they're getting actual content. And that's really great stuff. So this is available right now. This is the sort of thing we would love to get built into Firefox, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, Mozilla. Um, so before I move on to the next slide, let's see if I can get the rest of my water. It's gonna be a rough last half of the talk. Anyway, next slide is the Open Library API. Um, Open Library, as I mentioned, is a web page for every single book ever published. That's what we're striving for. We're not there yet because, wow, there's a lot of books. So if you have a book and you find it's not in the uh, Open Library, please add it. You can use this API to do so. Um, this is a fully RESTful API. It will return uh, information in both JSON or RDF format, depending upon what you request. With it, you can query the Open Library database. You can view record information, edit record information, like I said. This is like Wikipedia, you can edit. And like Wikipedia, we have a history for edits, so you can also get that. This is a really well-documented API, which unfortunately, I cannot say for all of our APIs. But this one is good. <gasps> Thank you. <laughs> if, if I still had my cookie from lunch. I still have mine, it's okay. Oh, yeah, I don't eat cookies, so uh, I would have given it to you. Um, OK, so the Open Library API, uh, it is fully documented at the URL I flashed up earlier, which it will be in the Zotero link, so meh, don't worry. Um, here's a really super quick example. I mean, like, super duper quick. I'm going to look for all the books in Open Library which have a subject of Pluto. I want it returned in JSON, and because I know there's going to be a lot, I'm going to limit it to one. Even then, I had to truncate information. Here's the JSON that I return. This is The Planets by Heather Cooper and Nigel Henbest. Way to go, Heather and Nigel. Um, you can see there's lots of information here. Uh, this is not a public scan, which means we can't lend it here. Um, you know, lots of information that you can get from this. This is a really robust API, really well documented. It's used in a lot of places. You may see this all the time and not even know it. It is uh, used by Evergreen. Evergreen is an open source integrated library system. I believe believe Koha, another open source ILS. Um, I believe you guys might also use it. Um, I'm not sure what Koha uses it for, but I know Evergreen uses it to retrieve book covers and say tables of contents and stuff like that. Yeah. Same thing. See, she's got water, she's got Koha information. I'm a and you're a librarian. Oh, she's, we love her. That explains, we, we always have at least one librarian in the crowd. Um, all right, so that is the Open Library API. Uh, we've got all these books. Um, some of them we get by being paid to scan for them. Others we just get from donated by individuals like y'all. Let's say you're moving house. Let's say you've got a ton of books and you've got like three copies of things. You can give some of those to us and we will scan them and make them available for checkout in openlibrary.org. And then we pu will put the physical objects into our physical archive. So. Everyone's a winner. The thing is, we're kind of in the Bay Area, and I don't know if you know a lot about the Bay Area, but land ain't cheap. So we can't have 87 copies of every single Harry Potter book in every single language. So um, what you can do is you can use the Do We Want It API. It does exactly what it says on the tin. <laughs> can you imagine that? Um, so uh, you can just 
use this uh, and throw an ISBN at the end of it, either ISBN 10 or ISBN 13, and our librarian friend here will tell you, yes, there's a difference. You do not have to strip the dashes because, OMG, this is programming. We can do that for you. Um, so let's see what this does. I'm going to throw this API, or this, API, yeah, this API call with the ISBN for this book by Mr. Neil Pluto Killer DeGrasse Tyson and Donald Goldsmith. Do we have this in the physical archive yet? Well, it turns out, no, we don't. We've got here, want for IAPA, want for Internet Archive, Physical Archive. Um, so it's really easy to tell what's going on. This is documented. Um, it's, it's sparse, but good documentation. So that's pretty nice. Uh, this is just a snippet of it. You can read it all at the URL I gave you earlier. So we've got all these books. It's really awesome. We've got all this stuff and music and videos and blah, 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 blah. All the things, right? Universal access to public knowledge or to human knowledge doesn't help if you can't find shit. So you can use the Internet Archive Search API. And let me warn you, when I use API here, I'm being, I'm playing just fast and loose with that definition. Because what this really is, is an extrapolatable URL format. It's not documented yet. It's on my list of things to do as soon as I get a few to it. Um, so what you do, is you go to the Internet Archive advanced search page. Let's say you want to find all the text about Pluto. So you enter text, the media type is text, the subject contains Pluto. Boom, done. What you get is a URL that looks like this. Oh, look, query, media type, text, and subject Pluto. What it will return, that will be in your location bar. And this is what you will see. So I can easily figure out how to do this in a program, and I haven't programmed full time since 2009 because hello, management. Um, I can figure out how to do that. But in order to use that, I got to get into web scraping. And I'm sorry, we're into web scraping. You don't want to do this. You really don't. What you would rather do is get it returned in JSON, or RDF, or XML, or RSS, or CSV. And you can do that with the advanced search page over here. And then you can see text, subject, Pluto, and collection is NASA, and identifier. This is all crap that I don't need. But output, JSON. That's what you need there. So you can get stuff returned to JSON, and now you can work with it. When I throw this URL into my browser, I get something that looks like that. This is severely truncated, because as you can imagine, there were a lot of entries. What I want to do here is to point out this is a thing called an identifier. We have 24 petabytes of unique data, right? All of that is organized into something we call an item. Each item has a unique identifier, and you get to come up with whatever you want with your own identifiers if you upload something to the archive. Um, they usually make some sort of sense. This is NASA Tech Doc 2005. Yeah, you can probably figure out what that means, right? Um, they are all unique. I wanted to show this because I'm going to use that identifier in an example in a minute. So how many out there have ever used Lucene or Elastic or one of those lovely search things? All right. If you have, then you already know what's on the next slide. This is a Lucene-based search. So you can do grouping and fuzzy matching and date ranges and all sorts of great stuff if you know the correct URL parameters to put on there, which I will get documented any day now. Um, so you can use this for that to find that information or you can use the Internet Archive Metadata API. Um, this allows you to data mine 24 petabytes of content. Why would you use this rather than just the search? Because this is wicked fast. The other one is not. Um, so here's that identifier I mentioned earlier. I'm going to pass it to the Metadata API to see what I get. What I get is a ton of metadata for that particular item. Um, so you can see this is from the Goddard Space Center. It is Terra Modus 250M observations are being applied. No, that's a description. What's the title? There we go. Estimating coastal turbidity using Modus 250M. Riveting stuff, I'm sure. Um, so you can get a lot, a lot of information with the metadata API, but you can also write information to it. If you have uploaded things to the archive, you can update them using the metadata API. Um, so let's say you are doing a podcast 
and you have new information or a table of contents you want to add to a particular item or a particular episode, you can use this to do that, to write that information. So you're probably thinking, OK, so that's really cool. You've got 24 petabytes of information. I've got stuff I want to share. Vicki, how do I share stuff to the archive? And I go, no problem. We have the Internet Archive S3 API. And this is part of the reason I'm standing up here with you today, because I am the maintainer of that documentation. Um, pull requests are welcome. Translations, mostly so. So this is really big. Um, I will very unhumbly tell you this is a well-documented API. So, so um, it does a lot of stuff. Uh, one thing I want to tell everyone that not a lot of people know, uh, so I've mentioned books and video and movies and just all these different media types that we keep in the archive. You all probably have files that don't fit into any of these media types. That's OK. All knowledge is human knowledge. We want all of your files, and we want to save them. So let's say you're a researcher, and you have a data set that doesn't fit into any of those media types. We can do that. We can save that. Let's say you work with GIS files. We can save that. Let's say you have photos. We can save that. So you can use this for all of your data, and we will save it for you, because it's human knowledge, and we want to make it available. And that's a key. It must be available. So if you give it to us, we're not going to hide it. All right? So we can't like only let certain people look at it. This is public knowledge. Potential question for later. Um, so with the IAS3 API, you can do all sorts of stuff. You can create the items on the archive. You can upload to them, maintain the metadata. You can download. You can search. You can do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, it is a really big API. Why it's called IAS3 is because it is a drop-in replacement for S3. How many of you have ever worked with S3? OK. Pick your favorite S3 client or library. Swap out a URL, and you are good to go. You are now writing to the archive. Or add an if statement and write to S3 and the archive. Um, so it's pretty involved. Um, I'm going to give you a really super short thing if anyone's ever futzed with S3, you'll look at this and go, oh god, the headers, the headers. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to throw this to curl. Here's the name of the file I'm going to upload. Let's assume I am lucky enough to have my own copy of a video from New Horizons. And because it's the right thing to do, I'm going to share it with the world and put it on the Internet Archive. Um, I get to define my own item name right there. That is my identifier. I'm going to name it Pluto Flyby because I'm not original and I was probably writing this at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and so I'm going to throw that to the archive. What it will do is it will create an item with this identifier. It will upload the file. And then it's going to do something that not a lot of people really know about, which is it's going to transcode this file. We believe that access is not, should not be limited by format of file. So let's say you only do Og Vorbis. That's OK. Give us time. Like a couple hours, maybe we will have transcoded this into Og Vorbis, H264. You know, a number of different formats. Not only does it make it more accessible to more people, but now we've got more copies, and lots of copies keep stuff safe. So we like that. Um, so that's pretty cool. You can turn off the uh, derivations. That's what we call it. Derive. We're going to derive these items. Um, you can turn that off, but really, why? So just. Know that it happens and never turn it off because it's awesome. As a really big, robust API, you can probably imagine this is in use in a lot of places. I'm going to give you three really quick examples. More water. Yay, water. Thank you, Red Hat. That's my plug for today. Banging on Mozilla and thanking Red Hat. Yep, I'm making friends in open source today. So the first example is from our own beloved Aaron Swartz. Um, he and his volunteers created Recap. And what Recap is, I don't know how many of you are not from America. None of you. OK, well, you still may not know this, but you have to pay for federal court documents. Um, but once you have them, you're free to do whatever you want with them. So what Aaron and his uh, friends did is made these available. You could buy them, click a button, and they would be avail made available in Internet Archive for anyone to get, which is really amazing. Um, 
And then we have Carl Malamud and his volunteers. They've done a very, very similar thing with the global public safety codes, which also are behind some sort of paywall crap. I'm sorry, public safety codes. Don't you kind of want people to have that? Well, Carl and his friends are making sure that that can happen. Um, and what you, you can probably guess, my favorite user of this API is NASA. So much amazing space geekery on the archive. Um, how many of you saw that Apollo movie with Tom Hanks? Awesome, yay, you wanna hear the original radio transmissions from all of that stuff? It's there. You want videos? It's there. You want tech docs? It's there. It's so cool. Um, and it's a great way to kind of skeeve off of work if you're having a bad afternoon. So those of you out there who haven't worked with API S3 yet, probably going, oh my god, I don't want to learn S3. Those of you who have worked with S3 are like, oh my god, I don't want to do that again. Um, that's OK, because we've got your back. More specifically, Jake Johnson at Internet Archive has your back. He has created this thing called IA Wrapper. What IA Wrapper is, is a Python wrapper around IAS3 API, the metadata API, the search API. It, creates you, it has utilities for a lot of stuff that you want to do. If you're a Python programmer, and hopefully soon to be a Perl programmer, oh, I didn't bring it out. There we go. Ha, huh. okay. Um, IA Wrapper includes a Python library you can import and use in all of your scripts. So you don't have to do any of that jiggery pokery or S3 headers. You can just use this. This is a script I use to download things. Um, even though I am a Perl girl, that's okay. It takes all kinds. Um, there's also a script for uploading things that I use to upload these very slides to Internet Archive. Um, all available on, inter on uh, GitHub. So IA Wrapper is about to hit version 1.0, and usually people hear that and like, whoa, I'm waiting for 1.0.1, right? Uh, this isn't an Apple operating system. This is actually stable now. This is incredibly well battle tested, and to prove it, Jason Scott and Archive team use IA Wrapper every single day to funnel terabytes and terabytes of information into the archive. If there was a problem with this, they would have found it. So I recommend you go and have a look at it and see whether it can help you do what you need to either gain access to or provide access to more information. So like I said, this was just going to be a shallow thing. This is only the tip of the iceberg. There's lots of documentation on these APIs that I have shown. I've given you the URLs. Um, so there's a lot more stuff to do that. So the APIs we've covered because, you know, it's late, we're tired, some of you are sleeping. We've got the Wayback API, Open Library, do we want it? Search in JSON, Metadata, IAS3, and IA Wrapper. So all those nice URLs I showed you earlier, I'm gonna show you again. If you didn't get them the first time, you can take a photo now. If you did, you get a really super cute kitty. And who doesn't love super cute kitties? I don't want an answer to that. Um, so here are those links again. We have two slides and a little under two minutes. So uh, the first one is we do accept donations. We accept uh, monetary donations here at archive.org slash donate. And we love this. It costs a lot of money to provide uh, universal access to human knowledge. So if you've got a few bucks, just you know, feel free to kick it our way. We'd be intensely grateful. Um, volunteers, always welcome. I already mentioned one opportunity, which is uh, working with Jason and his team to help fix up um, and continue work on JavaScript emulation in the browser. Um, so that's all great. And obviously, we will also take your data. We will save it for you. Yes, we can save that. That's our default answer is yes, we can do that. Um, one more slide. If you don't want to volunteer, we will pay you to do this. We are hiring. Um, predominantly Python people. Um, we've got some up here, uh, way back machine engineer and senior Python engineer. Um, I'm going to funnel you straight to Alexis for that. Alexis the ghost. Um, one more thing is that every single Friday, 
pretty much since the beginning of Internet Archive, we host an open free lunch for anyone who wants to walk in. And the entire team gets together in San Francisco, everyone who's there in, in that office, and they sit down and they have lunch and they get to talk about what they've been working on that week. And we have many guests every single week. So if you show up, you're not going to be that awkward person sitting in the back going, I don't know anyone. No, it's OK. It's cool. You also get a tour of the archive and that astonishing building. And you get to hear a lot more about our collection and our mission and the things that we do. And hey, free lunch. So that ain't bad. So that's really the end of what I've got for you. And we are exactly at 40 minutes. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions, but I'll stay up here for a few minutes. We can probably take them for five or so. Nobody's telling me no, so hey, let's do it. Yes, ma'am. So uh, the question is, if she gives me a book and she has not written it, does she have permission to do that? You can give a book to anyone, I know, right? I know that part, but can you then distribute the content of it? For the most part, yes. We are a library. Okay. I mean, just like any other library, we can do this. We can, make, uh, we can have access or provide access to this knowledge to people because we are a library. I don't know if anyone's been paying attention to uh, copyright uh, law recently, but the Ninth Federal Court um, upheld that it is fair use to scan and make available all of these books on the internet. So yeah, oh yeah, we can save that. <laughs> More questions? Ah, he was first, then yeah, because you've got a red hat. <laughs> um, Um, so the question is, and I'm repeating this for the recording. Um, well, no, no, this, this is good. So the question is, um, let's say you wrote something stupid on the internet when you were 16 um, and you need to take it down for some reason, or you don't want it public for some reason. Number one, if you don't want it public, never make it public. Number two, we do respect robots.txt. So if you have your own stuff, we will. You know, if your robots.txt says, yo, way back crawler. No, 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 no. You know, I believe, uh, what's the name of our crawler now, right now? Is it Heratrix or something? Oh, there's, a, there's a fact that will tell you how to turn off the way back crawler. Um, but otherwise, if it was public, it is public. And you can sue us and ask us to take it down. And we will point to copyright law and say, nope, sorry, it's cool. Um, so yeah, if it was public at one point, I believe uh, Alexis would be able to give you a, a better answer for that, but the default is, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Red Hat goes next. That was cute. Um, so I want to ask some more about volunteering. Like, are there things that folks can do who are uh, not really excellent programmers and don't have things to throw at them? Like, what else can they do? Ooh. The archive mission. Uh, so the question is, if you are not technical and you don't program, what can you do to help the archive? Um, yes, there are things you can do. Uh, you can help fix up metadata. Um, that is just so helpful to us. You can add things to Open Library. You can check on those. You can fix that data up. Um, there's a lot of other opportunities about which I am currently not as well informed. So please write alexis at archive.org and say, this is who I am, and this is what I can do. How can I help? And to be honest, that's how I got hired at Internet Archive way in the, back in the day, because I was director of engineering somewhere. And I said, hey, I'm bored at my job. I need a distraction. Can I come work and volunteer? And they're like, as a matter of fact, can we pay you? So. I, I am employed, in fact, I'm hiring. But. <laughs> oh, the hiring plug. That's OK, because Red Hat. <laughs> <laughs> that bottle of water has gone along. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. You had a question. So my question is sort of related to his question. Mm -hmm. um, but so he said, you know, stupid things that you might not want on the internet. What about sensitive information like PII? Do you have to take that down? 
Um, so the question is sensitive information like PII, if it gets out in the internet. Um, that's going to be a question for Alexis. Um, I'm not a lawyer and don't even play one on TV, but I like lawyers. So um, yeah, that one I'm not sure. I believe sensitive information, there is a mechanism to get that taken down because we want to do the right thing for the right reasons. We're not going to be dicks, right? We, we want to do the right thing. Uh, yes, sir, in the back in the blue. Uh, so the question is, open library API, the contents of the books are not searchable. You are correct. They are not searchable. Um, I don't believe we have indexed the contents of the 24 petabytes of stuff we have. Um, that would be an immense job and would be uh, would cost far more money than 15, 14 to 15 million dollars a year. So no, you can't do that right now. But you can go there, and if it's a book, it will be available in multiple formats. It will be available in text, EPUB, um, PDF. Those are those derivations that I mentioned before. So you can find a way to access them using the APIs and then search within the documents that you will have to retrieve yourself, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, so the question is the books as we scan them, what happens to them? What, what format are they in? Um, so uh, they are images in the PDFs. So it looks like if uh, you, I am really bad at archery, but I like archery. And so I, there's a lot of really cool old books about archery and let's say weaving and uh, sewing and knitting and stuff. And they look like you're reading an old book. And we have our own ebook reader that we have written that is open source. So if you want to put ebooks on your website, and they will uh, display PDF, and they will display EPUB. But we also OCR every single book we get. So there are text versions there that you can use, which is going to be considerably better download than a, an EPUB or a PDF. Um, we are six minutes over. I believe we're at a break, and then there's another break, and then there's a party. And yeah, so um, I, if you guys have any more questions, I'm going to be breaking down up here, um, not like in a musical way. But uh, yeah, come on up and thank you. <laughs>